Welcome to the Strong for Performance podcast, where we give coaches and consultants practical ideas for taking you to the next level in your business and in your life. I'm your host, Meredith Bell. I interview experts who've walked in your shoes and offer real world experience that you can apply to your own journey. Welcome to another episode of the Strong for Performance podcast. I'm your host, Meredith Bell, and I am delighted to have with me today Merrick Rosenberg as my guest. Welcome, Merrick. Thanks for having me, Meredith. Well, I'm so excited to have you, Merrick, because we've known each other a long time. Merrick and his business partner, Jeff Bacall, have worked with us, done business with us for just about 25 years now. So we go back a long way. We've both been in business a long time. 1994, I think, is when we first started working together. That's right. Merrick co-founded Team Builders Plus with Jeff Bacall in 1991 and then Take Flight Learning in 2012. And they have uh, created a very interesting company. Let me first tell you that Merrick is also an author He has authored three books that I'm going to mention today, and I think you have even more, but Personality Wins is one, then The Chameleon and Taking Flight. And all three of these books are about personality, and that's the topic we're going to focus on today. Just a little bit more about Merrick. Under his leadership as CEO of Take Flight Learning, his company has been selected as the New Jersey business of the year and named one of the fastest growing companies and best places to work in the Philadelphia area. So congratulations on those awards. And Merrick received his MBA from Drexel University, which recognized him as the Alumni Entrepreneur of the Year. Merrick has worked personally with more than half of the Fortune 100 companies in the U.S. and around the world. And I know, Merrick, you have a wonderful reputation for being a very dynamic presenter. And so I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. I know it's going to be fun, uh, entertaining, and interesting for my listeners. And of course, for those who are listening only. You can't see this image behind Merrick, which has four birds. So the first thing I have to ask is for you to tell us about those birds, because I know that people who are watching the video also are curious. Well, if you think about personality styles, there's a lot of different models out there. People know the Myers-Briggs, we know DISC, uh, and DISC has been around for a long time. Nobody owns DISC, it's just out there in the public domain. A lot of people don't know that. I think they they think maybe there's one version of it, but actually that's not true. Uh, There's many versions of of DISC profiles and assessments. And, And I taught the styles for many years and I just felt like it wasn't sticky. People would go, you know, you'd go back and you would talk to people three months later and they're like, I'm the D, wait, which one is that? And I'm like, all right, we need to reinvent this in a way that makes it memorable, makes it visual, something that you don't have to memorize. If it's intuitive, people will remember it because you don't have to, you don't have to memorize it. It's just, it's right there for you. So I swapped out the four disc styles and and swapped in some birds to make it nice and easy. Well, as someone who's an avid bird watcher, <laughs> I, I was intrigued to see what bird you had associated with each of those four styles. So why don't you describe which bird is associated with each one and what, why you chose that one? What, what does it represent? Sure. So, so if you start off and you think about an eagle, well, we could have some fun here. Like when you think of an eagle, what comes to mind for you? If a person had the traits of an eagle, what do you think that person would be like? Uh, well, they dominate. I've watched them steal fish from ospreys before. <laughs> so they like to take over. Um, and that is true. Uh, and uh, they're strong. You know, they have amazing strength in their claws and their wings. They're a very majestic bird. 
And when you think of it as a person, that's exactly right. They're strong, they're confident, they're take charge, they're assertive, they're direct. And, and you don't have to memorize that. That imagery of the bird is right there. And that's why I picked the eagle. When you think of that confident eagle style, it gives you the image of, of that person. Mm -hmm. so, so the next one is the parrot. So when you think of if a person had the traits of a parrot, what do you think that person would be like? Uh, talkative. <laughs> Yes, they will not win the quiet game. <laughs> no, that's right. Hard to uh, shut up. <laughs> they like to go on and on. Yeah, and they're, they're social. Yeah, they're, they're optimistic. They're energetic. They've got charisma, and they just bring fun wherever they go. Mm -hmm. That's, That's true. Very one. entertaining. Very entertaining. They, look, there's a, the parrot jungle, a whole place in Florida where you can go and just see parrots having fun. I've been there. It's right. They don't have like the owl jungle. No. <laughs> Let's do the dove next. When you think of a dove, what imagery comes to mind for you? Um, peace loving, because that's sort of a symbol of doves. They, um, they're not overly assertive. I've watched them, you know, in nature fly away when somebody else comes over and tries to take over their space. So they're, they are conflict fight. averse. They're not combative. <laughs> yeah, they're very conflict averse. <laughs> that is definitely true. Yeah, it's all about harmony and peace and compassion and caring and empathy. That's, that's you get at the imagery of the dove, they're u the universal symbols of hope or love. Mm -hmm. and, and compassion and caring. So the last one is the owl. So what do you think of what, what comes to mind for the owl? Well, wise, um, it, it, they're, they're cunning, they study things. You know, they, they kind of um, assess the landscape to see where are their prey. And then they are able to zero in very specifically on, on them. Exactly right. And that's a person. They're very observant. They process things. They have a plan. They're all about quality and accuracy. And the beauty of, of the four birds is you don't have to memorize the traits or what is red or what is the letter D. It's just there for you. So it takes out like an intermediate step or an intermediary step where I look at somebody and go, all right, that is an eagle or that is an owl. I don't have to think, wait, that's the D. Wait, which one is the D again? So it just makes it fun, makes it easy, and uh, it just makes it very intuitive for people. Now, I know some of my listeners are probably like me who don't like being pigeonholed into one type or style. And so we know human beings are complex. And so how do you <clears throat> explain to people you aren't just this one thing. And yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, it's just like the DISC model or any other assessment. You're a combination of all four of them to varying degrees. My style, I'm more of a parrot with a secondary eagle. Uh, my wife is an owl with a secondary dove. We, we each are a combination of all four, but there's probably one or two which are really predominant in you. We see those behaviors a lot. They're easy, they're natural, they're comfortable. You could do it all day. And there's probably one or two styles. Sure, you can do it. You can display the behaviors associated with that style, but it probably takes energy. And if you had to do it all day, you'd be exhausted at the end of the day. So thinking about styles, <clears throat> excuse me, in the workplace, how does it work in terms of two people who might be the same style versus people who have opposite styles? Which one creates the greater challenge <clears throat> in a work environment or is one more likely to create conflict than the other? Well, it's really about understanding. If you understand each other, then the judgment goes away. So you might think, having two people that are exactly the same would just get along well, but that's not always the case. You could have two eagles that just butt heads. You could have two owls that one says, this is the process. And the other says, no, this is the process. And they're debating on how they get it done. Uh, and so sometimes like styles can, can butt heads, but sometimes styles that are very different. You can have the parrot who just says, let's just go for it. We'll figure it out on the way. And the owl says, we're not leaving until we have a plan. <laughs> and so, so it's not as if there's certain styles or combinations of styles that tend to conflict more. What happens is if you understand yourself and you understand the other person, 
the judgment melts away. And we accept them for who they are. We appreciate what they bring to our interaction. And actually, if we have somebody who's very different and we value the styles, that's powerful because we say, look, they bring something to this equation that I don't have and I can't do very naturally or easily. So sometimes those opposites are, are, are quite effective. Opposites attract is true. In fact, we typically marry our opposite. Eagles and doves tend to be married most often and parrots and owls tend to be married most often. So sometimes opposites actually attract as opposed to repel. Hmm. Interesting. <clears throat> I really like what you said about not judging because I think that because of how many of us have been raised and how we think, it's if we discover something about ourselves, we naturally think, well, that's the better way to be, right? Uh, my way is the better way. How do you help people, you know, avoid judging others that are different from them and instead appreciate those differences? You know, it, as you ask that question, it reminds me of a story of my son when he was in fifth grade. And he was working on an art project in art class. And they, had to, they were given black paper and they had to put glue on the paper and then they'd sprinkle glitter on the, on the glue. And wherever you put glue, that's where the glitter stayed. Supposedly, then gets all over your car and your house and your dog. Uh, <laughs> but, but my son is sitting there. On one side is this, this young girl and she's you know in fifth grade and she goes, doo, 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 puts her glue down, throws the glitter down and declares herself done. On the other side, this, this boy very carefully, gently putting a little bit of glue and a little bit of glitter, standing back and looking at it, a little more glue, a little more glitter, looking at it again. And, and so my son's sitting between these two kids and, and the girl declares herself done. And the boy on the right side of him looks over and says, well, you're done, but look at it. I mean, look what you did. It's, I mean, it's a mess. And she's like, but I'm done. And, and so now they're arguing about, you know, what's going on here between the styles. Now, this was before I'd say the birds flew into my world. So I, I had taught my son the disc styles at this point. And, and so, so my, my son couldn't take it anymore. And finally, he just goes, you know, here's the thing. It's just that you're the D, you're the C, and that's all that's happening here. Okay, the D is the eagle, the C is the owl. And, and the teacher hears this and is like, whoa, whoa, we don't call names here. And she's like, my son's like, I'm not calling names. He's like the D style or she's the D style. That's what she is. And he's the C. And, and so he came home and he told me the story. And I said, so why did you say that? Like, what were you thinking? And he looks at me and goes, I just didn't understand. She's the D. She works fast and she finished it he's the C, you know, he took his time and he just wanted it to be right. I didn't understand why they were yelling at each other. And, and it reminded me of a quote by Krishnamurti, which was the highest form of human intelligence is the ability to observe without judging. And, and for here, here's a fifth grade kid who looked at this situation. He couldn't understand why are you arguing? She's being who she is, but he understood that that's, in my language, that's an eagle. He, he's more of the, the owl. And that's what happens when you understand these four styles. That when you understand why people are doing what they're doing and they're just being who they are, the judgment melts away. And when you melt away judgment, it gets replaced with acceptance. And, and imagine what happens to drama in the workplace when you can accept people for who they are. And, okay. and it was such a powerful moment. Oh, that, that's such a great example uh, because your, hus your husband, your son modeled this of observing. And I think that that's really a, a key piece there um, to, not, to not judge, to not assume because we do things a certain way that that's the right or better way. And recognizing those strengths. I know my husband and I are really different. He's much more the owl. I'm sort of a combination of, I guess, owl and parrot. It's an interesting contrast. <laughs> but I appreciate the things my husband does that are very detail-oriented. And, yeah, and, and when you appreciate it, then it adds respect to the relationship. You, you, you capitalize on the differences instead of judge the differences. And, and, and what happens in the workplace is that 
we impose our style on others because we feel like my way is the right way, mm -hmm. not a way, it's the way. And I know what it took for me to get into this, you know, the corner office. So if you want to be successful like me, I'm your manager, I'm going to tell you exactly how to do it. Yeah, but what if they're a different style and what works for them doesn't work for you? And so we impose our personality all the time. And we do it on our coworkers, we do it on our family. And the power of understanding the birds is not just reading a, a report, looking at a graph, remembering letters. We have to transcend that and, and really bring it into the world of application. And application is understanding ourselves, understanding others, and learning how to flex to their style instead of impose our style on them. Mm -hmm. And you've worked with thousands and thousands of leaders over the years and have conducted all kinds of assessments. I'm just curious if you have found any particular style who is, finds it easiest to be an effective leader. You know, anybody can be a successful leader. And, and, and here's the most important point is that your style does not determine how successful you will be as a leader but it does determine how you go about being a leader. And I'll give you a couple examples so you can practice a little people reading here. Good. Take somebody like a Bill Gates, just to show you how simple it is to apply this. Bill Gates, so what style do you think he is? Well, he's definitely got the, um, the owl in terms of thinking yeah. things through. Exactly, he's more of an owl. Picture Richard Branson. <laughs> Parrot. Right. You, it's like instantaneous blink moment. You know it. Steve Jobs. What do you think? Oh, I'd say he was a combination, but uh, Eagle. Yeah, exactly. Sure. Yeah, he's definitely more of an Eagle. And, and I'll give you somebody like a, like a Howard Schultz from Starbucks, uh, much more of that dove personality. Uh, and look, each one of them self-made billionaires, they drove incredible success, but they did it differently. And, and that's the important point, is that your style doesn't determine how successful you will be as a leader, as a salesperson, as an employee, as any role you play, it doesn't matter. It's going to, ter going to determine how you go about doing it, but anybody can be very successful. And I think we almost have to break that stigma. I think in America, we have this vision that eagles are the leaders. Like if I were to say to you, what style represents leadership, people think eagle. And yes, eagles can be great leaders, but so can the other styles. And that's really important to recognize. I mean, look, Abraham Lincoln, widely considered the greatest president in U.S. history, was a dove. So any style can play any role and be successful at it. Mm -hmm. That's such an important point because I think we tend to judge ourselves sometimes in how, how we come across, how we see ourselves, and, oh, I could never do that. And yet, the truth is, Merrick, we can be whatever we want in any given moment, right? We yeah. can stretch out of our comfort zone. And I think what you're saying, though, with the styles is there are some things that come more naturally to people in certain styles, and therefore, it's it would is it would you agree with this that it's sometimes easier for them to do certain kinds of tasks or take on certain kinds of projects whereas oh, another without person would find it more challenging yeah without a doubt if you, if you had a parrot versus an owl and you took that parrot and you said we're going to seat you in a cubicle and you have to crunch data for 8 hours a day without any human interaction now, how's that parrot going to feel at the end of the day? Like screaming. Yeah, just <laughs> exhausted. <laughs> like, kill me now. I'm, I'm just done. Now, put an owl in a cubicle for eight hours a day, and they're like, all right, uh, rock on. Let me have it. Let me do it. I'm, I'm ready. Now, take that owl and say, you're going to go to a conference, and you're going to be networking with people all day long, having a whole series of three to five minute interactions with people for eight hours. What do you think that owl's going to say? Exhausting. Absolutely. Whereas the parrot finishes that and then they go to the bar because they are energized and they want to meet more people. So 
yes, you can display any behavior, but we tend to be drawn to certain jobs that in a sense allow our skills to be visible and, and play out. You know, I worked with an accounting firm uh, it's 75 people in the room. How many parrots do you think were in that room? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one or two. <laughs> one is correct. And you're talking to him. <laughs> Literally, <laughs> there was only one parrot there and it was me. Uh, but look, I worked with a social media a PR firm in Chicago. Had about 40 people. Tons of parrots. I mean, not everyone was a parrot, but most of that room was parrots. It's social media. Social. That's parrots. So, you know, we are drawn to certain jobs. Uh, when I go and work in hospital systems, I often see nurses. We tend to find a lot of doves, but oftentimes the doctors are a lot of eagles. And that's often that clash between that eagle and dove energy. So mm -hmm. certain jobs tend to draw certain personality styles because that's what feeds them. Well, and I would think that the, what we're looking at there is the kind of activities they need to engage in to perform that job are a natural fit with their natural way of being anyway. Yeah, I, I always tell when I, uh, college students, when I speak to them, I, I always hear this, this advice which says, find something you love. And I think, okay, that's very cliche. I agree with this advice, but my advice to them is, find something that allows your personality to shine. Because when you are in a role in which your personality shines, you will go home every day energized. If you're in a role that doesn't really fit your style, you're going to go home every day depleted. And, and so find something that allows you to be you and it will feed you. Now, one thing I want to ask you about is how do you differentiate between style and personality? Do you see those as the same or different? Yeah, what's funny is this is a big contentious point between people in the DISC, DISC behavioral styles world and the Myers-Briggs world. It's almost as if years ago, Myers-Briggs said, we're personality, we're what's beneath the surface. And the DISC people said, well, we're behavior, what's above the surface. And actually, they're both wrong. That when you look at personality, if you were to look at the American Psychological Association's definition of personality, it's the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. They, those are the three words they describe personality. Thoughts and feelings are internal, which people would say is Myers-Briggs. Behaviors are external. People would say are DISC. But there are two sides of the same mm -hmm. coin. Mm -hmm. Our thoughts and feelings drive our external behaviors. If you have a feeling, an inner need, that you want something to be accurate and right and you want it done properly, then guess what the behavior is going to be? You have a plan, you have a system, you follow it exactly and you take your time and you're going to be seen as an owl. Uh, if you have an internal feeling like, I, I just want to have fun. I don't want to worry about the details. I want to be energized and excited. And then your external behaviors are exuberance and passion. You're the parrot. Well, our internal thoughts and feelings combined with our behaviors form our personality. So I use the word personality all the time. And I think that people in the disc world are like, wait, wait, no, 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 it's only behavior. Well, your behaviors are driven by your thoughts and feelings. Mm -hmm. So they're actually inherently tied together. You really can't separate them out. That's a great point. I like that because it's, it's well, I just think there's a lot of truth to it. It's we don't always um, recognize those three combined. So I think that's an important aspect. How do you help people bridge that gap when it's a real difference in personalities? Um, people. When they are, you know, they, they just get so frustrated. And I know you've encountered this with teams that you've worked with. Um, how do you help them get to where they're at a state of appreciation and acceptance rather than frustration? An aggravation. Yeah, it, oh, absolutely. Look, I'll give you an example. I was working with a team that had all eagles and parrots, but they had one owl team member. Now, you can probably guess, I'll give you two potential options here. That person, when you have one person who is not like the others, whatever that style is different, they're either the most valuable team member on that team 
or they drive everyone absolutely crazy. Which one do you think was more, was more likely was happening in that group? With that group, I would say the latter. He was driving, that person was driving them crazy. Absolutely, because the eagles and parrots were like, we've made a decision, and now your questions are just slowing us down. Because they went from idea to implementation in 2.3 seconds, and the owl is saying, wait, 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 wait. Have we thought about the impact on this department? Have we thought about if we change this system, what our biggest customer is going to think? Have we considered how right? they ask all these questions? And so what really happens is that when you get a team to understand that outlier style, that person who's different is going to save you, no matter which one it is, that when you get them to realize they are bringing something new to the team. And instead of judging them for being different, value the fact that they're adding something that you need. You may feel that that owl is slowing you down because you want to take a big risk, but they're also going to keep you safe. You may feel like if you have a whole team of doves and owls, that that parrot is coming up with these crazy ideas. Yeah, but they're breaking you out of old patterns and giving you new ways and new possibilities of seeing the future. And so the power of really understanding this is it creates the acceptance, it removes the judgment, it removes that drama, and it allows people to value each other instead of just steamroll those people who are different from the rest. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear some more stories and examples from your work with clients. What are some situations you can remember where because they gained this awareness, it really changed or even transformed the way they worked together and the results they produce. Cause of course it's all about results. Absolutely. And, and, and look, I'll give you an example. I was working with a, a state library system. So they had the state library director and all of the head librarians from each of the counties and the big schools and, and universities. I mean, librarians throughout the whole state. Now you can probably guess overwhelmingly almost every single person in that room was an owl a dove an owl dove or a dove owl i mean this is this is their world mm -hmm. so the 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 head librarian the state like the director of the whole state had retired she had played that role for like 40 years she was a dove and now she's gone and they brought in an eagle not even a secondary style but eagle off the charts eagle and they tasked her with revitalizing the library system, reinventing what they do. Libraries have changed over the years. What people need from libraries have changed over the years. Mm -hmm. And they brought her in to shake it up. So she came in. And what do you think she did day one? <laughs> Probably announced changes. Tons of changes. Everything. We're changing everything. And, and you can probably guess people love that, right? <laughs> Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so people were just, the, the, the librarians were so unhappy. It was creating so much stress for them. And I brought them in. Uh, we sat down in the room and, and I didn't have them reveal their styles yet because they, you know, they took the assessment, didn't have them reveal the styles. I started talking about them. And then I, I, I started with the person next to the, the, the director of the state library system. And I said, let's just go around the room and share what your style is. And they were like, owl. Dove, dove owl, owl dove, dove, owl dove. It went all the way around the room and then it comes back to her and she just is, looks at me and she just goes, eagle. <laughs> and the whole room burst out laughing. And it was almost like in that moment, that emotional release, there was the realization, you aren't doing any, anything against us. This is just you being you. And in fact, as we had the conversation, they realized, so you were brought in because of your style. You were brought in to transform the libraries throughout the state. And here we're judging you because you're not just letting us do what we've always done to get what we've always got. You're, we were brought in to get something new and different. And instantaneously, it was literally like in that one second, in that emotional release of them realizing she's an eagle. She's, this isn't against us. She's just being her. And it changed everything. It was, it was so powerful. Well, I love that story. And I also appreciate the fact that, you know, that people tend to think, take things personally, don't they? Because what you just described is a situation where they were getting upset thinking she was attacking them. 
as opposed to playing the role she had been hired to play. Yeah, and, it has and a whole different feel does. to it. Yeah, it's not, it's not, she's not doing things against you. She's just being who she is. And in fact, she's doing what she was hired to do. And it took out that personalness out of it. And it, it really just got them to realize, okay, we need to look at what you're doing. And she realized, okay, I probably should have interviewed all of you first in the sense of talk to you about what you're doing and how things are going instead of just walked in and started changing things day one. And she acknowledged that. She's like, I just figured that's what I was hired to do. So I started changing things. Uh, and, and how much information do I need to tell you? Just do it. Okay, I guess I probably needed to give you more information. I'll give you more information later <laughs> in the future. But, but it, was, it was so powerful. And, and when you, you think about how that situation plays out over and over, you get a new manager who comes in, they don't understand the team. Uh, you get a new team member. And how do you assimilate that team member into the group? When people understand the styles and they understand them very quickly, it allows a team to gel very fast. And that's how they build the yes. relationships that ultimately get the results. Well, let's talk about that. When you encounter someone for the first time, let's say our listeners are getting a pretty good understanding of each of these styles. But if you are, let's say you've just connected with someone on LinkedIn or some way that you've been introduced to someone, what are some ways, and, and let's address each of these, like through email or a phone call or these days a Zoom call, what are some cues that can give you an idea, not to put them in a box, but to understand how to best communicate with them, to understand what they are looking for in their interaction with someone else? Yeah, it's the beauty of the four birds. It's so simple. I'll, I'll look at it from a variety of perspectives. Let's take an eagle. In other words, I've always said, show me an email from somebody. I'll tell you, show me a half a dozen emails. I'll tell you their style. And you can do that. Uh, in other words, if, if you got an email from an eagle, how would you know this is from an eagle? What would be the telltale sign for you? Short. It's short and it's direct, right <laughs> to the point. Mm -hmm. Contrast that email with an owl email. What's the difference? Well, the owl would be very detailed, precise. Tons um, of information, attachments, <laughs> right? You get it, right? See how simple? Now a dove, how about this one? Dove emails always start off the same. How does it begin when you get an email from a dove? How are you doing? Yeah. Hi, how are you? Hope you're well. Have a great weekend. All right, you ready for this? One keystroke. It is the dead giveaway for a parrot. What do you think? When a parrot sends an email, it's a, it's a form of punctuation. I'll give you Oh, explanation. I was just going to say exclamation points. <laughs> In fact, parrots do have, often have to do an exclamation point sweep afterwards to make sure they haven't used too many of them. Even when they ask a question, sometimes their questions are so darn exciting. They have to use a form of punctuation created just for parrots because it is called the interrobang, which is a question mark, exclamation point, question mark, because <laughs> question is so exciting. It needs an exclamation point. So, so even from, even in written, right, in email, you can tell someone's style. Um, how about a a face to face interaction? I mean, I know some of you can see me if you're if you're watching this, but even if you're just hearing it, I'll, I'll model each of the styles. Imagine I'm introducing myself for the first time. See if you can figure out what style I am. If I just walked up to you and I said, "Hi there, Merrick Rosenberg. Nice to meet you." What style do you think that is? Sounds like an eagle. Right? Feel it? And direct. Mm -hmm. And non-emotional. No, just kind of, I don't want to, flat, you know, not, uh, but firm. And confident. You feel it. Mm -hmm. It's like a blink awareness, that blink moment. How about this one? Hi, how are you? So nice to meet you. My name's Merrick. That sounds more like a dove. Soft-spoken. You, you get it instantly, right? How about this? Hey, how are you? Nice to meet you. Merrick Rosenberg. So good to be here. <laughs> Parrot. <laughs> it's, everything about the parrot is just bigger. In fact, parrots don't even have any negative words in their language. If they have to say something negative, they take a positive word and negate it. Like they will never say, this is bad. They would say, this is not good. <laughs> or, or they'd never say, I'm sad. They might say, I am not happy. <laughs> And, and for, I know the last one's the owl because it's the last one left. But if I just walked up and said, hi, nice to meet you, Merrick Rosenberg. 
-hmm. formal, business-like, professional. But notice what we did there, whether it's verbal, whether it's in writing, you can tell somebody's style very, very quickly. Uh, it is just an energy about people that once you know these four styles, you get better and better at people reading and you can do it instantaneously. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of that, thinking of Zoom calls where you can interact and, and the visual is a part of it. I, I notice people who are more animated and expressive versus those that are less that, you know, not that way. They are more low key, I guess would be the word to say. So that's another that's right. thing I guess you can look for is the body right. language. Yeah, their energy level, uh, their charisma, their range of tone, how often they speak. You know, I've always said, look, if you have a meeting, there are three people who will always talk. It doesn't matter what the topic is. They're probably the parrots. And some eagles too. There are people. There are three people in that meeting who never talk. It doesn't matter what the topic is. Sometimes those doves can be fairly reserved. And then there are those people who speak if they have something important to say. And so the more reserved people tend to be the doves and the owls. The more direct, assertive people tend to be the eagles. The ones that add levity and humor tend to be the parrots. So you can just see by the amount of involvement, by the energy when they speak. Uh, you can just tell, and you can often tell by their background. It, oftentimes owls, they're, they're very attentive to what's sitting behind them. It's got to look very clean and, and proper. If you walk into an eagle's office, they're the one style that hangs up their diplomas, that has certificates, things they've earned, trophies. They're all out. Parrots look for action figures, <laughs> look for little stuffed animals they've gotten at a conference. Doves, those family portraits, drawings from children. So sometimes even just what's behind them, you can tell their style by how they've decorated the world around them. Hmm. That, that's very interesting. Um, I think just reflecting on what you've talked about, um, just wondering... What, what would be some overall advice that you would give people on how to work effectively with a variety of styles in a given office space or a given office or team? What are some tips that you might give? Yeah, the first one I would say is to be careful not to impose your personality on others. Yet we do this all the time. We think our way is the right way. And so we impose our style on others. We expect them to do things the way we do them. We expect them to want what we want. If I don't need a lot of information during times of change because I'm a parrot eagle, I assume you don't need a lot of information, but you're an owl dove and you do. That I need to accept that people have different needs and I need to make sure I'm not imposing my style, but rather that I am considering who I'm talking to and, and making sure I'm satisfying their needs. So that would be the first one. And the next one I would say is this, this is also a powerful way of thinking about how do you communicate? Imagine you're communicating to a group of people. So not, let's make the circle bigger instead of just one-on-one. -on -one, now you're talking in a meeting or in a sales call with a group of folks and you've, you don't know everybody's style in that room, or maybe you do and you realize there's eagles, parrots, doves, and owls in this room. How do I reach everybody? Well, I'll give you an example of this. Imagine I am announcing a new system that we're bringing into the, into the department. Now, whose style am I probably going to announce it in? Well, I'm probably going to announce it in my own style. For me, that would be a parrot eagle. So what do you think? If I'm a parrot eagle, how much detail am I going to provide? Very little. How much warning am I providing to them? None. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so, so how about this? I'll show you how to be, my, my, my second book's called The Chameleon. I'll show you how to be yes, the chameleon. Yes, I was going to ask you about okay. that. Yeah, it's, I'll show you how to be the chameleon. Imagine I'm announcing this new system to the, to the department. See if you can figure out what I'm doing here. I walk in and I say, all right, bottom line, Here's what we're doing. Here's when we're doing it. Here's our goal. Let me tell you, this is awesome. This new system, it is better, faster, easier than any system we have ever had before. Now I know it's new and I know it's different. We're going to take our time. We're going to keep you informed. It may be rocky at first, but I can tell you this. 
when this system's in place, it's gonna be better for us and our customers. So let me walk you through step by step. I'm gonna show you exactly what we're doing and why we are doing it. All right, so remember, if I would have just announced it in my own style, who would I appeal to? The eagles and the parrots. Exactly, but what did I just do there? You covered all four. Yeah. Which I really liked that you started with the bottom line because that's you won't lose those eagles right off the bat. <laughs> yeah. the attention span issues with those eagles. And yeah, you gotta hit them got first. the summary there. <laughs> and then you have the enthusiasm of excitement about it. And then you have the calming effect with the dove of n not ruffling feathers, so to speak, and, and keeping them informed. And then the step-by-step, -step, of course, was for the owls. Exactly. And, and, and here's the power of being the chameleon. When you communicate in all four styles, who do you, who do you connect with? All of them. Yeah. And, and, and the problem is that most leaders, most individuals, we tend to communicate in our own style. We don't really think about who am I talking to or in a group, how can I reach the whole group? We impose our style on them and we only really connect with people who are like us. Uh, but this is about the power of flexibility. Anybody can flex to any behavior uh, for even just a moment. And when you do, you trigger that innate hardwiring and you, they hear you. Uh, if you only stay in your style, they're not really connecting with you because you're not triggering how they're wired. And so this book that you wrote, The Chameleon, is that the main point of the book? This idea that you can, and I love the title, of course, because that's what chameleons do. They, they change with the environment. Yeah, it's, it's about adaptability. In fact, I wrote it so that when people would go through our full day training program, on the styles, learning about the styles, that I didn't want it to be repetitive. In fact, every lesson that I teach in The Chameleon, there's 22 fables, because I think people learn in little bite-sized wisdom. Uh, every one of those fables, except the first one, which teaches the four birds, is something new that I don't even hit on in our training program. So that it takes the styles to another level. So even people who have learned the DISC model or any model, I think that the fables will teach them something about style flexibility, about understanding. Some of the fables are uh, about eagles and parrots, some are doves and owls, some are all four. And of course, there's the all-knowing chameleon who kind of wanders in, shares some wisdom and wanders off. And, and then after each chapter, there's a chameleon wisdom section, which teaches them, how do you now use that lesson of that fable in your life as a yeah, parent? Yeah, I saw that and I like that, the practical application. Yeah, how do you use it? Like, that's the point. It's not just about awareness. It's yeah. how are you going to apply this in your world? And I think that's been the missing piece with a lot of DISC training and personality styles training is that it's just been about self-awareness. Now, the most self-aware people are the most successful people. So I'm not knocking self-awareness. But what do you do with that self-awareness? Mm -hmm. And that's the missing piece. It's mm -hmm. how do you apply that to build better relationships and get better results? Oh, Merrick, this has been great. And we, I know we could talk another hour on this, but we have come to time. And so what I'd love to do is, is get you to let people know how can they connect with you? How can they get copies of your book and follow up if they want to know more about the programs you offer? Sure, absolutely. You can go to takeflightlearning.com and see all the different training programs from our, our classic Taking Flight with Disc session to four other training programs based on the styles, chameleon leadership, chameleon selling, innovating ideas, rediscovering conflict. Uh, there's also a, we have a new certification for coaches uh, called coaching and style. How do you infuse the four birds into your coaching interactions? I think a lot of coaches use the DISC model or Berkman or Myers-Briggs, but they were never really taught how to use the styles in a coaching setting. So we have a, a two-day certification on how do you incorporate the birds in coaching. And, uh, and it's a lot of fun. The books are, wherever online books are sold, that tends to be where we're picking up books nowadays. So Amazon, they're in Audible and iTunes. So they're a lot of fun. And if you picked up The Chameleon uh, on uh, in Audible or iTunes, the audio version, I play guitar and I'm a parrot. And I thought, 
wouldn't it be cool to write a song about the four birds, which I sometimes play at the end of, of a conference talk on a, on a little ukulele <laughs> and involve the whole audience and uh, just the eagles, just the parrot. <laughs> so I wondered, would Audible know if I snuck a song at the end of the audiobook and didn't list it in the tracks? Evidently not. So there's a little bonus uh, song oh, cool. in the audio book. <laughs> Pretty funny. <laughs> That's great. Well, Merrick, thank you so much for being my guest today. It's been a pleasure talking to you. And I think many of my listeners are coaches. So I think they will be interested and intrigued by the certification you've created. And I encourage them to check that out. Is there any final thought you'd like to share before we sign off? Yeah, I would just... It's recommend to people, look for the styles around you. I always tell people, people reading is a skill set. The more you practice, the better you get. And my homework assignment, I always give people, go home, watch TV. I don't care if you're watching a sitcom or the news or a drama. Look for the styles, see how they're playing out, and then see how you would interact with those people. And the more you practice looking for the styles and the more you practice displaying the four styles, the better you can connect with everybody. Well, that's wonderful closing advice because really you and I are both in this business of helping people connect effectively with each other and understanding where someone else is coming from and what's important to them is a key aspect of that. So thank you so much for highlighting that today, Merrick. It's been so fun to get to talk to you. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. As always, you share your light with the world and I oh, appreciate that. Thanks for tuning in to the Strong for Performance podcast. Now head over to growstrongleaders.com to learn how our tools can increase your impact with clients and expand your business. And while you're there, grab our free ebook, The Five Secrets to Getting Better at Anything. Until next time, I'm Meredith Bell. Make it a great day.